the Zoom recording. Okay. Shall we have some music here? So, uh, yes, some, some lounge music. Okay, we're broadcasting. All right, so hello, everybody. We're going to, to just let, excuse me? Are you recording? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Yeah, and we're broadcasting. So I'm just gonna wait for uh, people to come in because it's not quite two o'clock yet. And you can see my, my welcome screen. Hello, everybody. People are just starting to come in. Greetings. Happy Thursday. So we're going to get started in just a moment. We'll give everybody a moment to trickle into our little virtual Q&A with Dr. Smoot. We'll be talking about facial rejuvenation. And he'll be taking your questions. So Feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A at any point, and we will make sure we get everything answered. And we'll just give everybody one more, maybe 30 seconds more, and we'll get going. Okay, we'll get started. So welcome. It's Monique at La Jolla Cosmetic Surgery Center for another one of our quarantine sessions. And uh, today we're going to spill the tea all about facial rejuvenation with Dr. John Smoot. And if you haven't met him before, he's just such a wonderful surgeon, a wonderful person. He's been in doing plastic surgery for over 30 years. So a lot of experience and he's the medical director for both our surgical practice and our medical spa. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, which is the FACS that you see on there. And he's a board certified plastic surgeon. And he's a member of the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, which we also call ASAPS and the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, which is ASPS. So those are really important designations uh, to know. And he was in, voted as one of San Diego's favorites last year in the San Diego Union Tribune Reader's Poll. And of course, as you know, and I'm sure you've all helped us get there every year, we've voted best in San Diego, uh, best plastic surgery group in San Diego, and we have 18 total awards from the best of San Diego. So one other thing to know about Dr. Smoot is he has over 600 five-star reviews and we have all of our reviews published on our website. They come in and they update daily. And um, so, you know, you can read from real patients from about their experience with Dr. Smoot and their surgery. And um, I just think that's a really nice thing to be able to know sort of what other patients have to say in their verified patient reviews. So it's, they can't get the survey unless they've had the surgery. So um, that's important. Uh, so for Dr. Smoot, I'm gonna pass it over to him and stop sharing my screen. Hello, how are you Dr. Smoot? Very good, except I'm really small on your screen right now. Oh, well, you, that? Uh, we're, you can change to the uh, gallery view or the speaker view in the top right. Okay. Did that work? But we, we can see you. Okay. Well, I don't see anything right now. Oh, Are we, are we well, we can see you. And there we go. Can, okay. You can see it. There, there we go. We go. Okay. <laughs> well, all right, welcome everybody to our quarantine webinar for this, evening, this afternoon. I'm glad you all could join us. As Monique said, I'm Dr. John Smoot. Uh, I've been here for uh, almost seven years now at this practice, but I've had my own practice for about 20 years uh, in the same area. But today, uh, I would very much like to talk about facial rejuvenation. 
Now, many people talk about this in terms of facelifting, and that's really a misnomer. I don't think we like to refer to it as facelifting, but facial rejuvenation, hence that's why we call this facial rejuvenation. Because what we're trying to do is to rejuvenate, to improve, to make one look better. What we're not trying to do is to make necessarily make you look younger, look different, but we're trying to improve where you are right now. Now, sometimes you do look younger, but the idea is to make you look better, feel better about yourself, and be more presentable to those outside your uh, family and those whom you work with. Now, facial rejuvenation is quite a bit different, um, but not different, but it, it covers a wide range of approaches. Because facial rejuvenation, if we start from the top and we're down, can deal with brow lift, sagging brows, which the brow lift improves. It could be your eyes, it could be the cheeks, it could be the jowls, it could be even down to the neck. All those areas comprise the facial rejuvenation, or the facial area which we would like to rejuvenate. Now, the other thing I'd like to make clear and is important is that one key does not fit every lock, meaning that one procedure is not the way you approach everybody. Every face is different, every need is different, but there are some general principles which I would like to make sure we all understand that although you may approach a little differently, some of the basics are the same. And those basic principles need to be adhered to every time you do a surgery to make the best outcome for anybody. Now, one of the things that we see as we grow older is two things happen. We lose the elasticity of our skin, hence causing some of the relaxation of our skin. We also tend to lose volume. Um, not always is the case, but usually what happens is that volume goes down, our cheeks sink in, our jowls start to deepen, and we start to get laxity in our neck. Now also, there's a lot of genetic component in this because you may have inherited your father or your mother's neck, your jowls, your forehead, even their eyes. Therefore, everything's a little different in terms of how you approach it. When we approach someone, we're trying to look at the entire package. A lot of people come in and say, well, I just want my neck fixed, or I just want my cheeks fixed, or I just wipe my eyes. And you can address that, but if you start addressing things in a patchwork fashion, that's what it looks like. You, you just kind of improve one area, but it doesn't improve another. The face is kind of a one homogeneous canvas, and we'd like to address the entire area. Now, some people don't have concerns about their eyes or forehead, and so they want to focus on their jowls and neck. Some just want to focus on their eyes and forehead. That's perfectly fine. The other issue is, and I, I equate this to something like um, taking a car that needs work. You know, if you take a car in and you start to straighten the frame up and redo the internal structures, that makes it straight. But, you know, sometimes you've got dents in the, in the car, you need to put some Bondo in there to fill it out, but then you, you have to do something for the skin. And the same way, or the shine of the car, paint on the top of the car, the same way goes for our faces. Now, we can do some structural things to straighten things up, pull things tighter, we need to put some filler in there. Then we gotta talk about the skin covering over the face. All those are dressed differently. Now, what we do depends on what your goal is and what you have to work with. The most common thing we like to do, and most commonly what you see is the jowling. This is what usually comes first. Then the neck laxity. Those are the use of the telltale signs of aging. Now, the other issue is around the eyes. And I'm not spending a lot of time talking about that, but a lot of people get heaviness of their eyelids, puffiness, or the bags. Those things will be created to open, or not created, but can be uh, addressed and repaired to give you a more awake, a better uh, look, so that you look like you're well rested. Now, the other thing we like to do is, in, as we get older, is like I said, we lose volume here. It's very common to use fat, which we can take from the from the abdomen or somewhere else to fill up this area here. So by, by so doing, the, the important thing in this is that we need to revolumize the face. Now, volumization is what makes one look 
youthful, makes them look healthy, more vibrant. We use that fat, usually taken from the stomach, the hips, the flanks, somewhere that we can use in, as a filler. Now, fat isn't always predictable, but it is pretty good in terms of uh, longevity. And it's the best thing we can use for longevity. Now, we can put other things in there. You've heard about Restylane, Juvederm, all those things, but those aren't permanent. They will go away. Now, if we get fat to take and work, it's, it usually stays forever. And we'll show you an example of that here in a minute. Now, this procedures, these procedures take anywhere from an hour and a half to four or five hours. Again, depending on the extent of what you want to have corrected. So from my standpoint, I want everyone to realize what is involved with this. It can be a subtle approach. It can be a more aggressive approach. The other big question that comes up often in consultations is, when do I need to have some facial rejuvenation done? And I tell patients, it basically comes down to when the discomfort for the improvement is worth the cost. I usually tell patients that the earlier you start to do rejuvenation, whether it be skin care, fillers, facelift, face rejuvenation with surgical procedures, the longer it's going to last and the better you're going to look. Or you can wait till you're much older. It's much more obvious. But again, it's harder to make good improvements the older you get because the skin becomes more crepey it becomes more lax and it's harder to adjust so just bear that in mind when you think about if you think you're ready to have a procedure now someone says what's the right age well there's no right age like i said it's when you feel it's worth the cost and the effort and the risk to get that kind of an outcome that could be in your 30s or 40s it could be in your 60 70 range also, men are good candidates as well. We do rejuvenations on men as well. So that's kind of an overview of what we talk about when we refer to facial rejuvenation. I didn't speak much about brow lifts, but that is just meant to elevate the brows if they become very heavy. Now that involves making decisions up in the hairline, up in this area here, and we're lifting the brow up. Um, it's not the biggest procedure we do, but it is sometimes a good adjunct to help someone lift their brow and make their eyes more open. Now, what I'd like to do now, uh, I'm gonna have, uh, Monique, if you'll pull up the very first photo. Yes. All right, now if you look here, she's side by side, before and after. On, her, on the left side is the before. If you'll notice the jowls, look at the sagging neck skin, and she's pointing that out there. That was her main complaint. So all we did was reposition the jowls up, tighten the neck, and we got the review you see on, on the right. Now if we take a side view on this, next photo, you can see how we tightened up the neck. The other question is, well, where do we put the scars? That's a, that's a very common question. The scar goes up in the hairline, and comes around the ear, and it comes just inside the ear, and then around behind the ear and back into her hairline. That's where we hide the scars. So you can see how we've lifted the jowls up, we've created a new jaw, a much more aesthetic jawline and neckline. Now, let's go to the second one. Okay. This is an oblique view. You can see how her jowls and cheeks, she just looks better. In fact, she looks a little even younger at this point. But again, the idea here was to make her look better and that's what was our goal for this. All right, let's go to the next view, next patient here. Now this is a gal that didn't need a lot of work done, but saying, you know, I just need something to be done here. So if you notice, we'll start with her eyes. Look at the puffiness underneath her eyelids, especially on the lower lids. She had the, that fat underneath her eye, that fat was removed, you can see on the post-op. Now if you look down around her mouth and her jowls, we did put some fat around her mouth. Notice it looks fuller, not huge, but it gives her a little more refreshed look. And if we go to her side view, you see how we repositioned the jowls up. Her neckline is much better. Her nasal labial around the mouth is a little fuller there. So again, it didn't necessarily make her look younger, but it made her look better. And again, the scars from the same place, which you can barely see right there. So this is where we can hide them. Um, okay. Now the last patient I want to show you 
is someone who didn't want much done. And this was what's called a mini lift, or we call a mini rejuvenation, where we don't go behind the ear. It's an incision that goes from up on the hairline down to the bottom of the ear. What it allows us to do is to lift the jowls up and also tighten the neck somewhat. We also put some fat around her mouth. As you see, look how her mouth looks a little more, a little fuller. She looks more vibrant. If you go to the side view, we see how we are able to lift the jowls up, pull up a nice neckline, look at the fullness around her mouth and the, what we call the nasal labial lines there. So this is what we can accomplish with a, a lesser procedure. Now, the determination of who needs a lesser procedure or a larger procedure is kind of dependent on what your goal is and how much laxity there is in the tissues. All right, let's go back to the, get it back on the screen here. Oh, and I have a question from the audience on okay. our first patient. Okay. They asked, how long after the procedure was the second photo, and how long does it take for the scars not to show, and is there a scar cream you can use after the procedure? All right, well, let's do this. Let me walk you through the kind of how it's done and the recovery and what to expect, you know, a week, six weeks, six months. Now, most of these procedures take anywhere from two to four hours to do. We do them under general anesthesia. We have uh, certified operating rooms and board certified anesthesiologists. The first night after your surgery, we bandage you all up. You can go home. You'll come back and see me the next day or one of our surgeons the next day. Then you'll see us in a week where we take all the stitches out. By about two weeks, give or take a day or two there, you're able to go back out in the public eye. Now, during those two weeks, you're gonna look terrible, meaning you'll be bruised, swollen. These are not terribly painful procedures. There is some discomfort, but it's mostly the way you look. But once we get you through that healing phase, the bruising, swelling goes down, you're pretty much able to go out in the public eye. You're not 100%, but at least you're presentable. Now, the scars, we try to hide them, like I said, in the hairline and around the ear. Usually by about six weeks to several months, those scars fade out and become very white lines. It's pretty rare that these scars become hyperpigmented or show. They can, but it's unusual. It's, there is some numbness you'll feel right in the front of the ear and around the neck sometimes, but that usually will go away over some time. So the scarring usually is a little red for a few weeks, but usually by about four to six weeks, it's pretty much gone, or not gone, but it's less visible. There's always gonna be a scar. Hence, that's why we try to hide the scars where we do. But usually in the facial area, they usually fade quite well. The redness fades. And the pictures you're seeing here are at about six weeks. Um, I think, yeah, both, all the photos here you're seeing are about six to eight weeks after surgery. Now, someone asked, well, how long does a facelift last? A facelift lasts pretty much depending on your genetics. Now, obviously, if I pull things tighter, it'll last longer, but then that doesn't have a natural look. That's one thing we're trying to achieve is a natural look. But depending on your environmental skin damage, your genetics, um, things like that will determine how long a facelift or facial rejuvenation will last. I hope that answered your question on that part. Any other questions? Oh, and, um, they asked about scar cream. Do you what? What do you do? You have anything that you want them to apply or not apply? Usually on the face, you don't need to apply scar creams because the facial area. I don't know why, but it seems to heal very well as compared to other parts of the body, the, the arms, the chest, the back, the abdomen. Those areas tend to not heal well, but the face has some ability to heal remarkably well. The eyelid incisions are the ones that heal the very best. They heal so well, sometimes I can't even see the scars. Um, one person asked if they're in their mid fifties, if you have a facelift now, how will that help with me with my aging process and would I need another facelift down the line? Well, using a, taking a facelift in the mid fifties is not a bad idea. Because what I mentioned before, the earlier you start intervening, the easier it is to maintain that look. Now, the question is, how long do they last? 
They could last two, three years. They could last 10 or 15 years. That is a function of your genetics, in other words, how good a skin you have, how much sun damage has occurred. Those are the factors that determine how long they last. The other question is, well, if I've already had a facelift, can I have another one? Absolutely, yes. We've done patients two or three times, sometimes four times. Again, it just depends on what your goal is and how good your genetics are. Um, another question came in. It said, my neck mostly bothers me. Can I just do a neck lift? Well, the problem with doing just a neck is your face isn't partitioned off in sections. Your neck kind of blends into your jowls to your cheek. So yes, we can focus on the lower part of the face, but you've got to adjust, address the whole issue. You need to adjust the jowling, you need to address the laxity of skin. Very often we'll remove fat in the neck, either with a liposuction or I'll directly excise it. Often we will tighten the muscles up, particularly if you have bands that go down through here, and we will remove those bands. The, but again, you've got to look at what you're trying to achieve. And it's just not, you just can't address one part of the face without affecting the other. That makes sense. I, I remember hearing an analogy about if you paint the front door of your house, then the whole house starts to look, the front door looks great, but the whole house, then you realize, oh gosh, I need to paint my whole house. Uh, uh, so one person asked, I'd like to have facial surgery soon, but would really like to lose about 20 pounds. And maybe with COVID, it might be 25. <laughs> it never means at home. Should I wait until after I've lost the weight? Yes. And the reason I'd like you to do that is because I don't know how your skin is going to retract. It may retract very well, and you may say, gee, I really don't need anything done. On the other hand, you may have a lot of laxity that has to be addressed. And once that fat is gone, it's a lot easier to shape and redrape the skin and do the changes we want to make. Because if we do it now, then you lose the weight, you're probably going to have more lax skin and require secondary procedure. Okay. Um, if you, they've had, this person said, if I had a facelift a year ago, what can I do to protect my investment or get longer lasting benefits? Okay. This is one thing I didn't address in this discussion, and I, I mentioned it, but it requires good skin care. Avoiding the things that are gonna age or damage your skin. So if you're on a good skincare regimen, that's the best thing you can do to maintain your result, meaning using good skincare products, using sunblocks. Uh, occasionally, if you want to do some laser treatments to help rejuvenate the skin, that's also helpful. The other issue was weight gain or weight loss. Those things will affect how it turns out. But the best thing to do is to, is to keep your skin protected from the damages, damaging uh, sun rays. Okay? Yes. Um, another question, approximately how long are we waiting to have these types of procedures? Oh, I see, since they're considered elective. Ah, so she means, or he means during the COVID. Well, right now we can't do hardly anything um, uh, because they, they basically have closed all our surgical operations down and our skincare programs have been closed down. We're hoping that the earliest, first of May, maybe May, middle of May, it just depends on when the governor is gonna allow us to open up again. And I think that's what segues nicely into, you know, we do have virtual consultations. And so if you are thinking about some sort of facial rejuvenation surgery, you can have a, we have a HIPAA compliant uh, Zoom platform and you can have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with Dr. Smoot now so that you can start planning ahead for once we are open, you'll be sort of ahead of the game um, there. Now, another question came in, does an eyelid lift change the shape of your eyes? Not usually. Um, again, depending what we're trying to accomplish here. But just to remove skin and fat, it will not. But what it will do, it will open up the eyes and you may see things that you didn't notice before because the skin was covering them up. Um, there are times when we do need to make some tightening of the lid to pull it tighter because it's lax, but that's a different problem in and of itself. 
But generally when you're talking about eyelid surgery, removing excess skin and fat, it does not change the shape of your eye, meaning where the eyelid crosses over the iris or the pupil or where it goes below the pupil. Those things don't change. Okay. Um, one person's asking about if they have acne scars or ice pick scars from acne. Um, years ago, they had some skin grafting done, still have some scars. You know, what do you do skin grafting or what would you recommend for scarring? Well, that's a very tough problem. Um, deep cystic acne scars are very difficult to correct. Um, mild acne, we can sometimes do some uh, laser treatments, uh, some skin dermabrading or things like that to improve it. But it's very hard to get that to be improved. Now, if you've actually had skin grafting, that's even a more difficult problem to improve. Okay. Um, so one person said, in the terms of the recovery between a mini or a full facelift, is there a big difference? Not a lot. It's still two weeks. Um, the difference is, is in the result, but the recovery time is essentially the same. There's a little less bruising, uh, swelling with a mini facelift, uh, but still I tell patients, you better plan on 10 to 14 days of being incognito. Now, it doesn't mean you can't go out, it just means you may not want to be seen like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I think at this point, all of us would like to get out. <laughs> we, we don't really care what we look like. Um, so one more question we have. Uh, if you have a mini facelift, could it be done under local anesthesia? Or what are my options? Generally, we do them under general anesthesia. Just because it's more comfortable for the patient, it's more comfortable for me because I don't have to worry about you moving. But on the mini facelifts, on occasions we can do them under sedation or local, depending on your preferences. It doesn't change the, the price a whole lot, but some people are definitely afraid of anesthesia, which I don't think they should be because our anesthesiologists are so good. Um, I think you should be more concerned about other things other than the anesthesia. Okay, um, and another question just popped up. Can you get a laser treatment under the eyes for wrinkles at the same time as let's say whatever facial rejuvenation or I guess could you do it with a surger, surgical or instead of sometimes an eyelid lift? Yes, you can. Very often we do combine those procedures. We'll do some rejuvenation in terms of lifting, fat grafting, and do some resurfacing. That's like I mentioned the car analogy when you have to put a new coat of paint on. That's what the laser does. It's it's cleaning up the skin, it's taking out some of the hyperpigmentation, the blotchy, the unevenness. It also does some skin tightening. Now we don't do a laser on the lower lids if we've done eyelid surgery, meaning removing fat. That's just too much damage to that skin to make it recover. So we will delay that. If we don't do any surgery on the eyes, yes, we can do just around the eyes, we can do the entire face. It just means a little longer recovery time. Because once you do a laser treatment on the skin, that's the thing that takes the most time and effort to get it to heal. It'll heal in about 10 to 12 days. But during that time, you look pretty awful. <laughs> well, if you're healing from something, you might as well heal from all of it, right? Um, great. So I'm going to share my screen again. Thank you, Dr. Smoot. I think we got all of the questions answered. And, um, and I will have this replay up later today so everybody can, and I'll have links on our website. But I want to show you, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I've got a couple more things before we... Oh, yes, go ahead. The most important thing I want you to understand is you need to speak to someone who's got experience in this. This type, these types of procedure is very important when you use experienced surgeons. Listen carefully to what they say, what they can achieve. Because what was always wanted is not always achievable. So talking to someone who's got experience, who's well-trained, American Board of Plastic Surgery is a good place to start. Knowing you're gonna get good advice and use standard, well-considered procedures that are done uh, throughout the country. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen.
And um, if you're, you can see our little thank you. So two things. Uh, one is feel free to, you know, get a virtual consultation with Dr. Smoot. And you can do that by calling or texting us or emailing us. And then the other thing I wanted to show you is I'll make this a little bit bigger. So if you go to our website, is ljcsc.com. So let me go to the home page and then I can walk you through. Um, a couple things. One that he just mentioned was talking about certification and safety. And so we have what is called the Glamipedia. And you just click on that and we have links to a lot of really great resources. So right here, you can learn about how to compare a compare surgeons, how to kind of read and be an expert on before and after photos, reviews, you know, what happens, there's all kinds of great stuff in here. So that's one thing I wanted to show you. The other thing is our gallery. And our gallery is, you can really look at it by, you know, types of procedure, I'll click on face, and then that opens up and you can take a look at all different types of procedures here. So let's say we were looking at eyelid lift. Everybody pops up. Now, let's say I wanted to see Dr. Smoot's eyelid lifts. I can pop that up. So now and you can see what you're refining, your, your filters are here, eyelid lift and which doctor, and then maybe you wanna filter by age or by gender. So and it will keep popping these up here. And you might get to the point where you make so many, um, oops, did you, is my, are you seeing my, my screen? No. Oh, okay, hold on one second. I don't know why, it's saying it's paused. So resume, uh, hold on one second. Let me see why it's not doing that. So I'll hit stop and then I'll hit share again and uh, Google Chrome gallery, here we go. Now, can you see it? There you go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so what I was showing is if you go over here, so the Glamipedia was here, and then the gallery is here, and it will start this way, and what, what I did was I hit face, and then I hit eyelid lift, and then you, will show everybody but here you can go down to which doctor and then filter by age or by gender so there's and like i say you could end up where it says no matches are found if you get too detailed you might you might miss one but um it's really nice because you might be able to find somebody who's had the same procedure that you're thinking about who's around your age and that's true for all the different procedures we have so you can sort of uh, you know, turn these on and off by just clicking. So we've got body procedures and non-surgical and everything. And then that, that Glamipedia, which I was talking about, where it will give you all kinds of really good uh, tips, financing calculator. You know, we do have financing. A lot of patients don't think about that. But when you go to buy a car, most of us don't go plop down a whole bunch of cash we finance it. And so your patient coordinator would work with you on that. So thank you all for coming. And thank you, Dr. Smoot. It was incredibly in, uh, great information. And I think, I hope everybody really enjoyed it. And we will see you again. Our next one is on Saturday. And Cameron, our esthetician, is going to be doing a Perfect Derma Peel live at 11 a.m. So join us then. You can just go to our events page, which is right up at the top of our website, and it will bring up all the new sessions that you can sign up for. So thanks all, and we will see you next time.